Hello and good evening. Uh, I'm Dan Jordan, owner of Roaring Stories. I'm delighted to welcome you all here this evening for what is a, a very special author event. We're delving into the wonderful new book from Paul Bengay, A Life in Garden Design. I'd like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of this country. Before we get underway, just a couple of uh, housekeeping requests. Could you all please check your phones and see their switch to silent? That would be much appreciated. You're certainly welcome to take photos, share comments on social media throughout uh, the course of the evening. We will allow plenty of time for questions. Uh, we are going to, in fact, be recording and live streaming the event here this evening. Uh, so when we do come to questions, for the benefit of our online audience, we will, in fact, just repeat those questions. Uh, folks, there's more chairs just down the front. As you now we've got Bevan in the front row. Um, when we do come to those questions, again, just for the benefit of us repeating the questions on stage, I uh, really request you keep those questions succinct, not statements, but questions would be much appreciated. And no questions about lemons or possums. <laughs> there you go. You have it on good authority. <laughs> if you uh, need a dinner tonight, uh, the restaurant downstairs will be open throughout the course of the evening. The event bar is to my right, so please do enjoy the wonderful hospitality of the Royal Oak here this evening. For over 30 years, Paul Bengay has fulfilled his clients' aspirations for gardens that are expressive of the timeless elegance and classic simplicity for which he is internationally renowned. Paul is widely regarded as the foremost garden designer in Australia today, and his extensive list of projects span private and public commissions in Australia, New Zealand, as well as further afield in Europe, North America, and in fact, West Indies. Known for his mastery of scale, balance, form, and colour, uh, Paul Bengay draws on his lifelong study of the natural and classical worlds to create gardens around the globe. This illustrated memoir, Paul Bengay, A Life in Garden Design, explores the evolution of one of Australia's finest garden minds. A visual delight, this book ranges from photos of childhood gardens and goats to hand-drawn plans <laughs> for Paul's earliest designs. <laughs> Through never-before-seen materials, the story behind Paul's vision is revealed, and we see the creative workings that come to fruition in meticulous and timeless gardens. It is an absolutely stunning book, and we're absolutely thrilled uh, to be involved here this evening. Joining Paul in conversation, we're also absolutely over the moon to welcome your host, Richard Unsworth. Richard Unsworth is a leading garden designer and writer based in Sydney and the owner of renowned outdoor design store, Garden Life. Having grown up in England, Richard moved to Sydney in the 1990s where he furthered his love of gardening with formal study in urban horticulture and started his first business focusing on inner city garden design. In 2001, Richard opened his first store, Garden Life. Richard has since expanded his practice to work in larger spaces, both in the city and further afield. Richard has contributed to the garden pages of both Bell and Good Weekend magazines. And passionate about the natural environment, he spends his free time restoring the heritage garden at uh, Trimpoli, his home in Pitwater, and helping other people better connect with nature and with each other through a series of wonderful bushwalks to raise money for the Indigenous Literacy Foundation, a wonderful uh, charity which, in fact, is our chosen charity at Roaring Stories. Mm. Richard is the author of numerous, numerous gardening books, the most recent of which is The City Garden, which we also have on sale tonight and in store. But I'm pleased to ask you all to give a very warm welcome. Paul Bangor. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Um, thanks for that introduction. And I've just turned over about three or four pages because I don't really need to reintroduce Paul <laughs> after that fantastic introduction. Um, and I mean, it is a beautiful book um, that we're here to talk about, Paul. And I got a copy on Friday and I immersed myself in it on the weekend. And I have to say, it is a really generous, big, weighty, meaty, you know, piece of piece of writing, really, as well as, of course, expecting beautiful pictures, but lots of you in there. It's a very personal book, and um, I love you know the photographs of your early life, um, early designs. There's there's a lot. You know, did that take 
you know, w when did you think about writing the book? Was that an easy thing to do for you? And maybe talk a little bit about the process of how that happened. Um, I think it was probably the, I think it's probably the easiest book I've had to write. Because when you're writing about yourself, I think that's, that you sort of, hopefully you know quite a bit about yourself. And that, that's, a lot e that that's a lot easier to articulate. Um, I've been writing it for quite a while, so it's been gestating for quite a while. And now I've got my wonderful new publishers, Thames and Hudson, and I took the idea to them and they just jumped on it. And I was just so excited they jumped on it. So I'd been reading, I'd been writing it like sort of piecemeal, funny enough, over the last 10 years. So I've been writing a bit about mentors, I've been writing, you know, sort of personal diary as I go along. So it's a matter of coll 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 collating all those um, writing pieces. They're all sitting on, on my desktop, all these files like mentors, personal diaries, all these sort of things, and pulling them all together. So it's been, it's sort of been sort of gestating for about 10 years, I'd say now. Yeah. And the, f the funny thing was that, you know, going back and trying to find photographs from, well, I want to say it nearly 60 years ago, is like really quite bloody difficult. Like the, there were no phones back then. Right. And I went to my father and I said, I need photographs of our childhood. I mean, he says, I, I don't really have any. It was really hard to find the very early photographs. And, and talking about early photographs and your father and, you know, the, you, you go into a lot of lovely detail about your early life, yeah. you know, which sounds really charming and idyllic. Yeah. And your, your parents were keen gardeners, yeah. working with native plants, yeah. you know, really heavily. You would have loved my mother. Ah, uh, right. Okay. So she was okay. very heavily involved with the Society for Growing Australian Native Plants. So, do you know the Elliots? Gwen and Roger Elliot. I've heard of the Elliots. I think yeah, who are yeah. one of the best writers of, of um, native plant books. They were great friends with them and we bought a, they bought a property together down at Wilson's Promontory and they revegetated that with native plants. And I grew up planting those plants down there at, at um, Wilson's Promontory. So and I grew up with a mother who was absolutely in love with native plants. And this was in the 70s? This is what? the 70s. 70s, yeah. when, when, every, when everybody was really, yeah. you know, native, native planting was huge. That's right. And there'd be one of this and one of that, or there'd yeah. be, you know, it was a, and, and it was a huge thing, which is nice to see things coming back to well, that I, again. I think the difference between now and then was I can remember they're obsessed with recreating the Australian bush in small gardens. And now people like you are bringing a new sense of design using Australian native plants. So we're not trying to recreate a dry creek bed or a Sahara, you know, a, a yeah. piece of desert. You're doing beautiful modern design, but using Australian native plants. And I think that's the big difference between the 70s and now. It's curated now, isn't it? And it's it thought is. about, and also people yeah. like Fiona, you know. But anyway, let's we're getting off topic, and Sorry. because it's, um, but let's talk about that early. Garden. I like talking about you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, we, I loved hearing about the garden next door to you. Yeah. Oh. Loved hearing about the garden, you know, next door to you where you grew up. There's a lovely yeah. Victorian kind of old rambling estate that, that the, 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 the housekeeper's in there sort of in, per in perpetuity until she dies. And you were there as a, as a kid, like getting in there, getting your hands dirty. And yeah. tell us a little bit about that. And so we were, very, we were very lucky. We, I grew up in the outer eastern suburbs of Melbourne and it was sort of not quite on the fringe, but luckily enough, next to my parents' place, there was a 20 acre Edwardian, and I can just describe it as you know this better than anyone. It was like modelled on an English estate, so it had ken large kennels, it had a housekeeper's house, it had a gardener's cottage, it had a big garage with a chauffeur's quarters, and a beautiful big old house. But it was very run down, and so the owners had died some time ago, and left it. They couldn't be sold until the housekeeper died, till the, and she lived on for about twenty or thirty years. And I became friends with her as a very young boy, and she gave me free roam of this 20 acres. So I built a big vegetable garden there, I had milking goats there, and I used to prune the old orchard there. And I think I got my love, that great sense of scale, like large scale, from growing up in that big space. Oh. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we start all over again. Um, so yeah, so it was it was very big, and and I think my big sense of scale came from you know growing up in that in that that sort of large environment. I wasn't restricted to the quarter acre block. I had twenty acres. Yeah. And I just thought that's how everyone lived. Yeah. Growing up there, and way. immediately became really comfortable in that environment. And Loved it, and yeah. and I think that's where I got my sense, my love of the countryside. So we we were talking before. If I could spend my whole life in the country, I'd be happy. Coming into the city is just sort of distresses me now. 
maybe as we as we become more mature in our years, like it is that thing about, and I think the months, the, the more time you spend in the country, the more time you want to be there, and yeah. the, the city becomes a little bit more vexing. Well, it's that sense of freedom, isn't it? You know, as a designer, you don't have to worry about councils, you don't have to worry about neighbours, you don't have to worry about regulations. It's just so much easier. It is. It yeah. is. Now, I want to talk about early influences in your in your work, and your your, your mum bought you. Um, Russell Page's book, The yeah. Education of a Gardener, and, yeah. and do you want to just talk a little bit about your, I mean Russell Page, uh, you know, he was a prolific gardener in the 20th century yeah. in, in the UK, he was very significant. And he's still, I think he's still, like there's, there's Russell Page and then there's David Hicks under that, Russell Page is still my gardening absolute hero. If anyone wants to um, really learn about garden design, they've got to buy The Education of a Gardener by Russell Page. And what, what makes it such an influence for you? Why does he... He, so he just spoke about like his whole life about working with clients. I think it wasn't so much... Well, he got proportion absolutely 100% right. And I think that's, that's, really, that's a really an important lesson to learn. And you, you, he doesn't talk about proportion so much, but you see the, his great sense of proportion through his photographs of his books. Um, but he writes about just how he interacts with clients, you know, how he manages clients, how he massages clients, how he travels around the world working and, and, and creating gardens. And for me, that was just absolute gold grow, growing up. And the, and the funny thing now, it's like a big circle that's come around. I'm now, there's a, the a Russell Page Archive Council that exists at the Garden History Museum in London. Everyone should go visit, they visit London, go to the Garden History Museum, it's amazing. And they collect all the Russell Page archives. Right, okay. And I'm on that council. And as, as being a council member, you get to go to um, Russell Page gardens that are never open to the public. And so I was lucky enough to go visit Morella Agnelli's garden and have lunch with her wow. in the garden that Russell Page had created for her probably 50, 60 years ago. And she spoke about, and you'll appreciate this, how they fought about, he came and said that tree has to be knocked down and she refused to knock down the tree and they had a big fight about it. It's like, nice to know that they still had conflicts between clients and, who, who won? and designers. She won. She won. She absolutely the won. The client's yeah. always right. client's always right. And she told client's me, I just, I'm just going to digress for one second because it's a lovely story. There was a, there was a monkey puzzle oh. tree in the garden and it was dying. And they got an American arborist in and he said, oh no, it's the soil, didn't work. They got a French arborist in, he said, no, it's not lack of water or something. And it still kept dying. And they got an Italian arborist in and he said, no, it's missing love. It needs love. <laughs> and so they planted another monkey puzzle next to it and it flourished. Oh. Oh, okay. And it was that rhizome activity that was apparently going on between them that worked. Love wins. And she told me this story. It was an amazing story she told me. That's lovely. Yeah. Love conquers all. It does. You heard it here. Um, so you have a slight obsession with Vita Sackville West. I do. And the, uh, I guess, um, I remember seeing Sissinghurst for the first time, you know, when I saw it for the first time. And but did so, you see it when you lived there? Um, no, I didn't. Hmm. I never saw it when I lived there. I left it when I was 22 and, you know, I, I came away, came back here and then went back. I actually didn't see a lot of major gardens when I was living there and it was only really after being here that I wanted to go, go back, back and explore. Yeah. Um, what, where does your, what first piqued your interest about Vita? So uh, next, uh, not only did I have that beautiful property that I could grow up in, but our local library, I don't know what the librarian was thinking of, but she collected um, Gertrude Jekyll and Vita Sackle West books. And so I'd go down as a like 12 year old and borrow these books and read about how she bought that castle with 500 year old tumbling walls, with ferns growing out of the walls, and that just that sense of history that we didn't really have in our architecture in Australia just really sang to me. And I like, I just became obsessed with it. And so I became slightly obsessed with her, which has led now to me, um, I've got, got, got nearly every one of her first edition books signed. I've got the only known love letter between Vita Sackville West and Virginia Woolf talking about their physical love that I bought in auction. So I've got this great collection. Of Is it a little racy? It's, no, it's not that racy. Okay. <laughs> Certainly wouldn't make porn hard. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, when you first went to that garden, like yeah. what, tell us a little bit about how you felt when you, when you saw that garden with your own eyes. Because it is very different. 
I remember seeing a garden in print that I wanted to go and see, which yeah. was um, a garden in Provence, and he called a Vesian's garden yeah. in, in, in La Louvre, and I, and, I, and I really wanted to see it. And the first time I walked in there, it was just that, that beautiful feeling of yeah. seeing it for the first time with your own eyes. Well, I think it, it was, for me, it was walking in there and seeing those beautiful, it was the architecture of the garden that I absolutely loved. Like, I think I go back every year and I learn a lot from the planting schemes, and Troy's doing an amazing job of, of adding to the planting schemes and this, they keep modernising the planting schemes. I learn a lot from that, learn more from great digs about planting schemes than that. But I think it was, it was more about the architecture, how it was about all the way she created garden rooms within that old castle walls and that was just amazing like the scale of it the scale of those lovely big old walls and the and the mellow color of the bricks sort of was just was incredibly so it was it was a great experience going there for the first time definitely and just some of that lovely detail in just all those paths and i, yeah. I, I love we, I, well, I, you talk about going to to see these gardens with your tape measure you go to see yeah. these gardens with your tape measure obviously camera but you're measuring rises you're yeah. measuring you know how how steps would fall in a garden and and kind of just it's going in there it's going and into for the anyone who's not interested in gardens i'm the worst traveling companion in the world because all i do is take photos i come back from holidays and i'll got photographs of gates doors paths and i do i go measure out the height of a, a riser and the width of a tread and the width of paths and i think that's that's people ask me what inspires you and i think travel is one of the great things that do inspire me because yeah. i just learn so much from traveling around the world yeah. and taking my tape measure and taking my phone and taking lots of photographs and, and walking around with your eyes open yeah. as we do i mean in the book there are pages and pages of those details of, of, of yeah. you know if architectural details doors gateways and it's um i remember seeing you know you, you one of your first book i mean you, you've written like 55 or something i don't it, well you've written 11 books I 11 is, books, it, is yeah. this the 11th or? i think this is the 11th and yeah. and, and i remember like the bo the boxed garden yeah. you know it, one of the earlier ones and seeing that level of detail in your work then i, I kind of knew that, that you know you, you were apart from many other people that i was looking at because of the level of detail in the construction yeah. you know so you're known as a plants person but you also have this balance with constructed form which yeah. is not always there and it, it with with, uh, with designers you know and, and and that always seems to have been something that you've been very confident in doing and i think that uh, that comes from about being almost like a frustrated architect i don't think I, i'm good enough ever to be an architect but i think for me like architecture in the garden is a huge thing and being able to create the built form was always m almost more important than the plant the plants in the garden to me yeah um, it's became a little less so now but in my early stages yes it was definitely that way yeah and going around the world and just taking photographs measuring everything yeah. was a good way of learning that it's the best inspiration yeah. isn't it yeah, yeah. um the you know you had a lot of break we were talking before and i, I just put it to you that you, you'd had a lot of you've had good fortune in your early life your early career you know the right time the right place yeah. the right people obviously yeah. mixed with talent of course too because you, you know but um can you talk to us about some of the these early people you know and give give, give us an insight into who they were for you there's a, a guy a chap called john truscott so um, john john truscott was he won two academy awards i don't know whether anyone knows john truscott he did brisbane expo like you're all probably too young <laughs> making me feel old <laughs> um, he designed Brisbane Expo he um, came down did the Melbourne Festival for like quite a few years it was, it was started as Spoleto and became the Melbourne Festival and I had my shop in Malvern Road and um, he walked into the shop and he said I want you to show gardening as an art form and I went oh that sounds quite good and so he said here's two hundred thousand dollars I'm going to give you a site opposite the Melbourne Arts Centre on a platform on scaffold with a marquee over it and I want you to create a two week exhibition showing garden as an art form. And so we just created these gardens inside this marquee and we had no idea how it was going to be perceived and the first day it opened there was a queue all the way down St Kilda Road for people to come in and it became part of Melbourne's sort of, it was really endearing to Melbourne's sort of psyche back then. You did became, that for a few years. We didn't did you? it for like five years, six years. We had Leo Schofield as an artistic director, Richard Werrett as an artistic director, um, carried on right through the Melbourne Festival. He was, and, and, and he was really incredible because he'd come from um, the theatre and from, from creating movies in, in yeah. Los Angeles, and he showed me how to use theatre 
in gardens. Yeah. And I think that was a really interesting lesson to learn. And, and the most important thing was he would never settle for anything than the absolute best. Right. And so I'd do things and he'd come and go, that is absolute shit. Pull it out and yeah. do it again. He was honest. And he was honest, yeah. Mm, mm. And, so and he was an amazing teacher. And design is, like landscape design is a bit of, like, it is a bit like, in some ways, production design, you're, you're editing, editing the landscape, you know, opening views up, closing yeah. views off, you know, it's, 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 it's. Well, he was like, you know, bring drama to the garden. Like, you know, don't make it mundane and boring, bring drama in, create drama in certain places in the garden. Light was really important to him, like, you know, create shape, light and darkness in the garden. And again, and that, that thing with scale and playing with scale for instant impact. And, and he was drama. great at scale, really yeah. great at scale. Um, Kevin O'Neill. Um, so Kevin O'Neill, I mean, it's, very, it's a little Melbourne-centric, sorry for this, but like Kevin O'Neill was the Saskia of the grander flora of Melbourne. She was, every florist will bow down to Kevin's talents. He was an amazing, amazing florist. And um, I first, I was at college and I went and did work experience in his florist shop. And I swept the floors, that's what work experience was back then. And he said, no, you need to come up to my beautiful house at Mount Macedon, which was way up in the mountains of, and cool. And it was the most beautiful romantic garden I've ever seen. And I worked in that garden. And then he gave me my first start. He helped, we went equal partners in my, in my shop and introduced me to lots of clients. And it just really, that was part of the luck story yeah. that I got that first leg up. Yeah, And he Fantastic. was incredible. And he, again, he knew how to manage clients. Like he had a great um, affinity with clients. And I think for designers, you know, being a designer garden is only part of the way there, isn't it? You know, if you're an absolute asshole, don't get on with people. You're not going to get many jobs. No, you're not. No. You're not. You're not. Um, <laughs> John Coote. Um, you had a long professional relationship with John Coote, didn't I you? I do. Yeah. John, and, it, and he sounds like a fun tap. And he, he sounds like a bit of a, not a, I don't want to say a rogue. No, he was he, a complete rogue. <laughs> <laughs> but he was a great interior designer in Melbourne. He worked all over the world. He bought the most beautiful Palladian house in, in Ireland. And I went and worked on the on the wall garden there and he gave me great jobs, you know, in Ireland and England. And back, this was in then. the eighties? No, I think it was probably the nineties. Okay. Yeah. And he he did all the big sort of grand houses in, in Melbourne. And we just worked well together. And it, and we created like big houses in the in the Victorian countryside. And for him, like, you know, he created the architecture and I created the garden, the suit. We just had this great synergy between the two of us. And again from him I like everything was big. You know, he was he was a big person, he was overweight, but he was quite flamboyant. And he would say, let's not put the drive from the shortest distance to the front door. Let's go the longest way we can go around the whole paddock so you get a lovely view of the house and then in. Which drove clients, you know, instead of taking one minute to get to the front door, it could take them 10 minutes to get to the front door. Yeah. But it just looked the best. Which is what you, in, in big properties, that's kind of, it's all about the drive yeah, to the house. And exactly. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, another huge learning experience, really, isn't yeah. it? And, and, and somebody that had... Um, and you, you went on to work together with him around Australia and overseas. And all over the world. Doing yeah. garden. He, he really was one of the first people to take me overseas and, and, and get me jobs. Yeah. I mean, he, he was not afraid to just pack up and go overseas and work. Right, okay. So lucky that way. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Nice. Um, David Hicks, um, how... how, how did that relationship So, Dave, so come John about? Coote, I mean, in, John Coote in, introduced me to David Hicks. Does everyone know so who David Hicks is? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Really famous English decorator. Probably, I think everyone in England now sort of says he's one of the greatest English decorators of the last century, and they still pay homage to him. Every time you read something, um, you read about someone being inspired by David Hicks. And I'm great friends with his daughter, India Hicks, now. And his wife, um, um, Lady Pamela Hicks is still alive. I and like every time I go to England, I go around there for lunch, and it's just incredible. She seems quite a hoot, actually. Oh, I've she's a real on, hoot. On Instagram, there's a yeah. few videos of, of Lady Pamela kind of talking about like early days, and it is pretty fun. It, 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 it's interesting. Like it's, and her it's memory. Another, it's from another time. It's isn't complete it? other time. It's yeah. complete, almost complete fantasy to us now. Uh, her father was the last viceroy of India. And she grew up in India with him. And, and just the story she has to tell. And she recalls these stories. And she's 96 now. And she just sits there and tells you these, these stories with the greatest um, memory. It's incredible. Yeah. Like, I can hardly remember clients from two years ago. <laughs> I don't know how she does it. Um, 
Would you? Is there any other clients or, or people that you'd, you'd call out as a highlight that you've that you'd? Um, I, I think I was very lucky to meet David because he, you know, he started in interior design and then went to garden design. And I went over and saw his garden at the Grove, which I still go to, and Lady Pamela still lives there. And it was the first time I'd seen a real garden in England that was completely different to everything else you'd seen in England. It was really masculine. It was very strong. It was very, ge very geometric. Not pretty. No flowers. And that really sang to me back then. I was like, I was very inspired by, by, by what he did. And he took me to one job he did in Portugal where he was the interior designer, garden designer, and architect. That was for um, um, Madame yeah, Garni. Madame Garni. Yeah, yeah. 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 She seemed, and she, yeah. it was just beautiful. <laughs> like, you've never seen anything with such continuity like this property. It was just amazing to have the one designer do everything. Yeah, wonderful. And, yeah. A, and the budget. And the budget. And the yeah. budget. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, always need the budget. That helps. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It does. Um, so, it, I think we all know and love Cruden Farm. Uh, the, you know, the Cruden Farm story where in, in 1928, uh, Keith Murdoch, Rupert Murdoch's father, gave his 19-year-old bride Elizabeth, a, you know, a small farm as a wedding present, and um, she only passed away, Dame Elizabeth, in 2012, aged 103. And you mentioned that she, you know, she planted an oak tree, yeah, and, and she planted an oak tree as a young woman, yeah. and saw it mature, and and you know, as a lived to see it as a mature tree. She lived to see it as an 80 year old tree. Yeah, well. And she would go sit under there every day and have a cup of tea because, you know, how many people can say they've lived in the one garden for 80 years? Mm, mm. I mean, much to, I'm now a trustee of Cruden Farm, so I'm sort of entrusted to look after it with, with, with the family and that's a great honour. I went there when I was at college. So John Patrick, I had John Patrick as a, right. as a senior lecturer, yeah. and um, he took us to Cruden Farm, and I met her, and I got on really well with her, and I kept going back there. But I mean, I, I think it's just amazing to have someone who planted the garden and lived to see it 80 years old. Yeah. Like our garden in Stonefield is only 20 years old, I can't imagine what it'd be like in 60 years' time. Yeah. Wouldn't that be rewarding? What a, what a wonderful thing to, to experience but she, the same I garden. Mean, mm. Keith, so Keith Murdoch actually gave her Edna Walling, as a present as well. And, and you mention in the book that you sort of allude to the fact that she kind of... She hated it. She hated it. She hated right. her, it and she hated her. She hated her. Yeah. Right. So she went there as a, she went there as a 19 year old and they went on their honeymoon, came back and Edna Walling and created the garden. And she just really hated the fact that someone else had imposed had their, their sense of design on the garden. She might have liked her more if she hadn't have done that and maybe, the, you know, but it... Well, I think I she know. was so strong-minded, she just hated the thought of anyone else doing anything for her. But um, Edna Walling actually gave us that beautiful um, Citriodora, that lemon scented That, is, that is beautiful. Oh, yeah. And that's in the book. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's if anyone book. can go to Cruden, it's open to the public all the time now, so it's worth going just to look at the driveway. Yeah, right. It's sensational. Okay. Um, where is where is Cruden Farm? How far? It's... it's 40 minutes out of Melbourne. Okay. Yeah, Langwarren. Okay. It's, it's on the Mornington Peninsula. Not at the, you know, the very start of the Mornington Peninsula. And what does being a trustee of the, of the garden, what does that entail? Really? Well, it's quite difficult because there's four family members on the board and we've got to like manage their expectations of how the house and the garden should move forward. But Dame Elizabeth left it in for the good of the public and to be used recreationally and to and to preserve the garden by the public, so she left a you know very direct um, uh, directions of how we should actually use it. But sometimes managing people is not people so easy. is not so easy. <laughs> Strong-willed people, yeah. yeah. Um, let's talk about Stonefields um, because I don't know. Has anybody been to Stonefields here? Has any anyone visited? No. Okay. Well, Melbourne. Melbourne. Okay. <laughs> um, Wrong crowd. It's. I mean, it, what was the what was your main inspiration for Stonefields? Again, it, there's lots of pages of, of Stonefields in the book, and it, it's. I can see that it's changed in the years that you've had it very much. So, so I guess I'd like to know what was the inspiration for Stonefields, and how has the garden evolved over time? I think um, well, the inspiration was that I you know I'd moved from Wood End, which was only 20 minutes away, but it was in a country town, and um, it was hard. I didn't have much. I had two acres there, but I was sort of bit built up around, I could hear people's mowers on the weekend and they, they put a footpath out the front, a concrete footpath out the front and curbs and I hated that so I thought I'll, I'll find somewhere that's really rural that will stay rural and I moved 
10 minutes further on into this lovely 100 acre property. And the, the, the inspiration really was, it was very, very loosely based on an Italian hillside villa. So it was more about how the Italians create villas on top of a hill and capture the view and then do a formal garden on the back side of it. So it was about the garden funneling the view of, of, of the valley below. But I think, I think the hard thing, and then you were alluding to that, is that like I created that garden 20 years ago and fashions change. So we've got that really formal parterre that no one would do these days. And you've, you know, it's, it's sort of a hard decision. Do you keep it? Do you pull it out? Do you, know, do you bow to fashion? Do you sort of become a slave to it? Or mm. do, you, do you leave it mm. and sort of you know, work, think, work other areas that are more in, in you, tune with how we live today? You've loosened, the gar you've loosened it up in a way, haven't you? You've loosened the garden up a little in, in some ways of planting deep borders you yeah. know, around the pool. And yeah. I think you, know, you added herbaceous elements. Uh, yeah. but, but also I think there's such beautiful structure there that and, and it's a it's a it's a it's an elegant garden and i don't think elegance goes out of fashion you know well, hopefully I mean, hopefully not yeah it would yeah. be you can't well i suppose if we followed that that school of thought we wouldn't have Sissinghurst, we wouldn't have great dixie we wouldn't have, wouldn't have cruden farm that's right you know it would be changed yeah. every 10 or 15 yeah. years yeah so. did v i mean I, 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 do you think vita probably wouldn't have been pulling no i mean but i mean she didn't just, change she didn't change the structure of it at all he changes the planting scheme. I think that's probably what you can do. And that's what we do at Stonefields, that we do experiment with new plants. We do try new perennials, we tr try new woodland plants. Mm. So we're always refreshing the planting mm. scheme. And is, it, I mean, maybe back then too, there was no, of course, there was no scrolling, no social media no. when Vita was gardening. I mean, you know. It wasn't when we created Stonefields. No, right. We're that old. Yeah. I mean, no, that's, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, um, Things would have stayed for longer. When we have this fascination, I think these days with being on trend or being fashionable, but really, you know, I think we need to stick to stick to whether it's envir you know, environmental. Just stick to beauty yeah. as well, whether it's yeah. but stick to our. And, and I think that Instagram is being good in a lot of ways, and it's very bad in a lot of ways. And you, you'll know this as well is that like people will, when you go for your first meeting and they show you images of what they like. 20 years ago, they couldn't show you many images. Now they show you a million images. And you know, you're in the outback New South Wales with no water and they're showing you beautiful hydrangea walks. And I go, can't have that, sorry. And they don't believe that you can have it. And they go, but it looks good in Instagram. And I go, well, it looks good because it's cool there and it might look good for two weeks of the year, that's it. Do you think that, you, 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 something again you mentioned in the book, I did read it, um, that you, um, Guard, people, clients used to trust their designers more yeah. and is that sort of a little bit about what you mean that people used to basically trust you more, they hired you for your reputation, they did. Paul, they, Paul's going to do yeah. me a beautiful garden, I don't need yeah. to show him images because I, you know. We well, you know, we go through um, all the phases of documenting gardens, of, of creating design. And when I first started, I used to hand draw everything and have mechanical rubber to draw it, you know, to rub it out, and an ammonia printer. And so you would just show a client just one flat plan of a hand drawn plan, and they would trust you. Right. And they'd put that gut. You might make a few changes about what they want or here or there, and that was the end of it. And then it was get, it got built. Yep. Now there's pages and pages of documentation. It's got to be in 3D. We've got to be able to walk through the bloody thing. You know, I don't like the colour of that there or that there. And it's like, so there's, I think there is definitely less trust these days. Um, if we can talk about Stonefields still, I like, I, I actually haven't been. So I, I, and Richie, I, you have to come down. I know. I, I, well, I would love to come down, but are we running out of time? Because I did read, you know, we've, we've all we've read, heard in the press about it being sold. Yeah. Um, is that something that's still happening? Is it's, that something it's, we can... It, they're, 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 they're supposed to settle in November. Okay. Um, it's from a well-known, we know who it's from. The, gar the, the gardener? Yes. Yeah, yeah, the other gar and the gardener. And we're just waiting to see whether that actually happens. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. If it doesn't happen, we'll be there for a little bit longer. Yeah, okay, yeah. terrific. Thank you. Didn't want to put you on the spot, no, but you know, right. I need to <laughs> get there. Okay. Um, so, have, um, have you got a favourite anec anecdote or reference from the book that... Um, what are you most proud of in the book, I guess? What are you, or what was most difficult to write about? Was there anything? Um, no, it was not dif there was no difficult writing in there at all. I just love putting everything that I've d discovered along the way. Like the real journey for the last 40 years was just so easy to put on the paper 
there was not really anything really difficult there at all. I liked. So, I mean, I've been like like you say, I've been very lucky. I've had great clients. Um, I've had great relationships with clients. There's there's the f the first clients I ever worked with, um, the Kimberley family that um, started Just Jeans, and I'm still working for them to this day. And I think that you know, I've just been very fortunate in my career to have such wonderful clients that we get on well with, and we just have repeat um, jobs with. Them. Yeah, yeah, lovely. So that's nothing. And, and, nothing, and nothing really difficult in there. I'm just trying to think. If there's anything difficult in there? No. There's a lot of personal stuff which I really, really enjoyed reading. It's mm. A lot of stuff that I didn't know about you. Um, just to talk about, I mean, you know, 2023. You know, we we we're about to go into, you know, evidently three years of drought. Mm. Um, we had, you know, in September, 33 days over 35 degrees in yeah. Sydney. You know, there's a, there is a climate crisis. I believe, you know, uh, you know, we're in the midst of it. Um, how, you know, can we garden like we used to garden? No. You know, can we? How do we? No, as, we definitely as, can't. And as garden designers, how can we? You know, I also believe we have a role of ed, of education in a, in, a, yeah. in a way of how do we talk to clients about you know the the plants that need to be going in that are more resilient and and, and what have you been I guess doing in your well, practice or I think uh, that. Um, I think definitely the, the fashion is for more environmental gardening, thanks to people like you and Fiona, and, and I think people are a lot more conscious of what's happening with the environment. I think that's, that's definitely true. I think there's a little bit of complacency around still. I think if we talk in three years' time after we've run out of water and Sydney's on restrictions and Melbourne's on restrictions, it'll be a different conversation, and I think people will be more, more aware of it. But I think that you know generally Australia is maturing in terms of its garden design philosophy and that we are considering more drought hardy plants we just we just are and we're using a lot more um native plants yeah and you're you're and you're, you're, you're even me you're incorporating those in yeah. your gardens too and yeah, yeah. a lot yeah quite yeah. a lot yeah. and i think that i think the wonderful thing is that we're not using them like we did in the 1970s and we're integrating them with mediterranean style plants and we're getting this wonderful palette of plants that are that are more appropriate to the dry climate we're going towards um, but it's not necessarily 100% natives, but it does incorporate some. Yeah, no, it's, it's great to see. It really is. And it, it, it's more learning, isn't it? And it's more learning again about combining yeah. these plants with other plants that it's, um, it, it's like a, yeah, my practice at, at gardening at pit waters opened open my eyes to that too. And just yeah. to see how those even grasses with succulents and things like that combine. And, no, it's and I think that like maybe five years ago, that was a very hard conversation to have with gardeners, maybe a bit longer than that. Like people were very reluctant to give up all the plants that required a lot of water, um, and I think they're a lot more um, uh, willing to give that up these days. Yeah, completely now. Yeah, I think the next big frontier is going to be lawns. Yeah, Bevan doesn't want to hear that, but like <laughs> already in the UK, you know, there's a very anti-lawn movement yep. in the UK. And it's and, and and we can I mean lawns as we know it or the image of our the ideal and that image of lawns as we know it maybe has to and it's true like we have green lawns that I water at at pit water like and I, I there's, there's green lawns there and I'm going I shouldn't be watering this but I, I kind of don't want it to die no. it's an interesting well because it's been so easy yeah and they've yeah. been so practical and, and the they've been so and, beautiful and, and the dams are full and you know, <coughs> exactly we okay. can water them but I you know in three mm. years time we have this conversation it'll mm. be different. it'll be it will be different. Yeah, yeah. And Prince Charles says that you know you shouldn't think about a lawn as a lawn. You should think about it as a green space. Yeah, right. And so that might be more about like weeds or just plants that survive that yeah. we can walk on. Yeah. That don't look pristine all the and time. And things like microlina and that there's there's native grasses that can be. Yeah. You know that you can. We just got to get rid of all that buffalo and cooch and yeah. things first. Not so um, easy. Not so easy. No. Especially not cooch. Um, the. On a more personal note, there's two, you know, your acknowledgements in the back. You, you, you talk really beautifully about uh, Julie Gibbs and Annie Smithers. Yeah. Now, I know one of those women very well, yeah. but you've had a very long relationship with Julie, a lot yeah. longer than I have. Do you want to just talk about Julie and Annie and those two women? And I, I really enjoyed reading, you know, your... your so, Julie Gibbs, um, we're about the same age. And when I first started off, I can't. I was like in my twenties, and she came to me and she said, "You have to." She was at Alan and Unwin back then, and she said, "You have to do a book." And I went, "I hadn't even thought about doing a book." And I was like, "I can't do a book. I've got. N how can I write that? I've got no, no conception of how to do a book." She said, "Don't worry. I'll hold your hand, 
and we would do it the whole way. Well, the next week she left Alan and I went and moved on to Penguin and left me behind. But she managed to take me on to, she took me on to Penguin. And we've just had a great relationship. I think she's one of the best publishers in Australia. She still is. And uh, we did 10 books together or nine, yeah, book, nine books together. And um, she's just an amazing person. And this book would not be here today without her. Right. Like I would not have contemplated doing books without Julie. It's yeah. amazing. And Annie Smithers, she's with Thames and Hudson. She, um, does, she's, she lives us, near us, near Dalesford. She's got a little restaurant called De Fumier, and she grows all her own food. She's passionate about growing her own food and use, only using food from our local area and does French farmhouse cooking. And you can, you can hear Annie uh, talking to um, on Radio National on a Saturday morning. Yeah. And Paul. Yeah. But, you, but Annie's been doing it for quite a few years She's now. She's been doing it a lot longer than I do. She, I do once a month, she does twice a month. And it's a great little nine o'clock, I think, on Radio National called By Design. And, but she is, she sounds like just putting, like putting on a, a really like hand-knitted warm, like a hand-knitted cardigan or something, Annie. She's just, is she like that in real life? She's, she's, um, she's just gorgeous and we're just the best friends. And she's the, one of those friends like I ring up and I go, oh, there's something wrong with my bloody Brussels sprouts. What's gone wrong with the Brussels sprouts? And she'll have the answer. Like she'll, and she'll ring me and go, you know, you're a gay male and you love pars with edging. I'm a lesbian, I hate password energy, but I think I'm coming around to your way of thinking. <laughs> and we rolled through that, and we just got that great sort of reputation with each other. You know, we nice. sort of get on nice. and, and have that great banter with each other. Yeah, lovely. Nice. And she's just a, you know, she's just a great sounding board for me. Yeah, nice.